Hi, this is Dr. Richard Ruling here to share with you another uh, uh, focus on the Sabbath School lessons, uh, which are on Revelation this quarter. This, uh, again, is an example of huge information, very important, missed totally by the Sabbath School quarterly, in my opinion. And you be the judge, okay? Uh, and by the way, the, the word Laodicea, uh, which is the last church, means people in a time of judgment. That's uh, Leo is people, Leos, and Decea, decree, a judgment, uh, people in a time of judgment, or judging the people. And it's interesting also that God in, in uh, the book of Daniel is, Daniel means God is my judge, and uh, judges were deliverers. In the book of Judges, uh, Samson, Gideon, and others, were they were there to deliver the people. God will deliver us if we're really seeking him, but uh, it's not just uh, assume it's going to be okay and uh, all you need is a relationship with Jesus. Uh, how can we be saved if we don't do what he says, okay? And we're going to look a little deeper this uh, quarter in this lesson today because uh, something huge that was really missed, uh, uh, actually we're going to look at two facts. One, first of all, is that uh, the um, we're, we're dealing with the Sabbath School quarterly, which is the, this week is dealing with the messages to the seven churches. We're just going to look at one. We're going to look at the Laodicean church. It's on Thursday's lesson. And uh, I have also a, um, I need to see the text so I can read it to you. The, uh, it says, Jesus did not rebuke the uh, Christians in Laodicea for serious sin, uh, uh, such as heresy or apostasy. Rather, the problem was complacency leading to spiritual lethargy. Uh, well, that's not quite true. There's nothing good said about the Laodicean church in uh, Revelation 3. If you look it up, uh, and the criticism of blind and naked is really severe. Uh, Ellen White uses the term uh, a, a startling denunciation in Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page uh, 252. She uses that term twice, startling denunciation. And uh, she says it's applicable to the church of the present time. And uh, she wrote that uh, uh, before uh, 1882. The, the next chapter is 1882, so it, it must be then or before. And uh, serious problem for the churches uh, back then, but I don't think we've gotten any better. Okay, And uh, here it says that uh, Jesus assures the Laodiceans that he loves them, appeals for them for repent, and he's standing at the door knocking, uh, and that any, everyone who opens the door may uh, share his throne with him in eternity. Well, uh, I wish it were as easy as that. Uh, bottom line, uh, I think we got problems. Um, we seem to think that uh, if we just stay with the church, it's going to be fine. But uh, the messenger uh, to the church is really the angel to the church. When it says, speak to the angel, before each church it says to the angel of the church, here's the message. And uh, the angel isn't naked and, and blind, it is the messenger to the church. Uh, and, and naked uh, if you use the Bible to interpret what that means, Ephesians 6, 9, 14, 6, 14 says, uh, let your loins be girded with truth. So if we're naked, we really don't have the truth on something. And my point is, it's on the, uh, on the uh, wedding parables, because the wedding parables have the information in reverse image to this. Uh, it, it, Luke's wedding parable has seven parallels to the Laodicean message. Uh, in her... Uh, classic book, uh, Education, by Ellen White, page 123. Easy to remember, 123. Last words on the page uh, says that every prophecy is an explanation of another, and every truth a development of some other truth. And uh, the, the startling fact is that those wedding parables are not about cake in heaven when he comes in the sky. We will get there. We'll have a big supper, yes. But the wedding parables are not about the second coming in the sky. Uh, we overlook the fact that uh, uh, Israel became the bride of Christ at Sinai when they made a covenant, and God later said, I'm married to you. And the problem was that God got an ignorant bride. Uh, they worshipped a calf 40 days later, as you recall. So a uh, bad situation, and this must not happen to Christ. He's already paid a horrible price for us, and uh, it, it must not uh, be, uh, again, uh, like Israel's covenant with, uh, with God's covenant with Israel. 
uh, somehow we need a better situation, and I believe it's embedded in the wedding parables. If we understand them, if each prophecy is an explanation of some other, and we put the wedding parables together, we can see a bigger picture, a development of some other truth that we haven't seen. That's why Laodicea is, is blind and naked. And by the way, that's a bad combination for a knock at the door. Blind means you can't find the door very well, and naked means you, you can't open it if you did get there. So uh, we really need uh, uh, a closer look at this, and this, again, I'm saying, is addressed to the agalos or messenger. Now, it's not about an angel, it's about, and it's not about the church primarily, it's to the messenger to the church who's got this condition. Uh, I believe that if the messages were clear, uh, there, would be, there would be a bigger response and a better understanding, but right now we are pictured as the ten virgins uh, asleep with our lights out on this topic at a time when we need to be waking up because uh, it is impending, okay? So, having said that, let's uh, step back and look at uh, one of the wedding parables that I've never heard a sermon on. It's Luke 12, but this Luke 12 passage has seven parallels to the Laodicean message. Uh, both are end time. Uh, by the way, uh, both, are, both are not understood very well because Peter says, are you giving this uh, parable to us or to all? And it is a wedding parable because verse 36 talks about him coming from the wedding and knocking, okay, uh, for us specifically. So, but let's count up, count them up. They're both in time. Uh, Christ says, blessed is the servant whom his Lord finds so doing when he comes. But again, this is not the second coming. This is like God coming to Egypt when he came and exercised judgment and took Israel to a covenant and later said, I'll marry you. And Paul included that passage of the Exodus and he said, Brethren, I would not have you ignorant how that our fathers all passed through the sea. All those things happened for examples, written for us at the end of the world. So uh, if that's for us, the wedding is for us, because that's, uh, that was the focus. He went, uh, to, uh, took them to Sinai, made a covenant. And that's Ellen White's last definition of church. In Prophets and Kings, page 7, 13, and 14, she says, What God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he'll finally accomplish through his church on earth today, even his covenant-keeping people. Now, we're not there yet. We are not keeping a covenant. We haven't made the covenant yet. It's a collective agreement that we must make at a strategic time after he knocks, and he hasn't knocked yet. How do I know? Okay, uh, only two passages in the New Testament where Christ knocks. This parable in the wedding, and again, Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. But uh, I've asked numerous ministers, do you know how that church ended? And most of them do not know. But you can, if you have a Young's Concordance, you can look up Laodicea, uh, a, a church in, uh, in Asia Minor that ended in an earthquake around 63 AD. Okay, serious knock. Okay, and we said last week in our, our uh, video that we shared that Christ uh, is has the uh, uh, voice of a great trumpet in Revelation 1.10. We said the first use of the word trumpet is Mount Sinai when Christ uh, in Exodus 19 uh, came down on the mountain, confrontation with God and his law, many judgment day, and the mountain shook, okay, earthquake, mountain shaking, people were afraid, fear God, give glory to him. So uh, that must proclaim our message. We're so poor at proclaiming that first angel's message. We're so focused on third angel and Sabbath and Sunday. But uh, for the judgment of the living, it needs that sequence again, time of judgment, life and death issues as the book of Daniel. Be ready, understand it. And it was linked with a wedding parable, wedding message in 1844 when they gave a midnight cry, the bridegroom comes. And uh, the true witness, Christ, in Revelation 10 verse 11 said, you must prophesy again. And prophesy again means uh, give those same messages. Uh, bridegroom's coming, okay? And it's, again, I'm saying not in the sky, it's in judgment that he's coming. And it takes judgment to decide who your bride is, okay? And it's going to split wise and foolish. The lukewarm people are going to be either hot or cold after that. And we need to understand so we can be on the hot side, uh, those who choose him, and get married. And so really, uh, let's look at the wedding parables. First of all, I'm going to count up the seven. End time church, okay, for when he comes in judgment. Secondly, it says, have your loins girded. 
This is like, uh, this is uh, Luke 12, 35, but it's like the uh, Laodicea is naked, needs white raiment, okay? Laodicea is blind, needs eye salve, but here it says have your lights burning, okay? So light to see, uh, those, are, those are three. When I come and knock, okay, both places have a knock, so that's step number four. Both are to open, number five. Number six, if you open, uh, I will make you sit down to eat. Now, both places have a, a, a meal included. And the, the greatest blessing of all, promised to Laodicea overcomers, is that I, I, he will sit with me on my throne. In Luke 12:44, it's I will make him ruler over all that he has. Since my name is ruling, I really want to understand that. But it's not about me. It's about 144,000 who get it who can become the bride of Christ. Uh, and, and it is the 144,000 which are virgins in Revelation 14:4. They must be the wise virgins to get into the wedding in Matthew 25, verse 10, when the door is shut. Okay, no more after that. So uh, this isn't about everybody. It's not about 20 million Adventists uh, or even evangelicals. Uh, I believe if some evangelicals are more worthy than many Adventists, for their searching and their seeking. They just didn't, they weren't born in the right place like some of us were, okay? But God uh, isn't against them, and they may end up uh, taking some of our crowns, okay, if we don't wake up to, to this situation. And I um, want to take you to, in fact, I want, I'm indebted to an evangelical by the name of James Dobson, Focus on the Family, who shared this insight to first century marriages. They were contracted when a man and his son would go to another home of a man and his daughter and the men would talk about price and the young couple might be talking for the first time and they probably talked about everything money family sex kids religion work ethic attitudes food etc and if the conversations were uh, good and they were happy with it the dad of the boy would give his son a cup of grape juice who would offer it to the young lady and he would say, this is my blood, I'll shed it for you. And if she accepted and drank from that cup, that was marriage. They were officially engaged. He would go and build a room on his dad's house. She would sew and get ready. And in about a year, he would show up for the wedding. And uh, there wasn't any funny time in between. It, was, uh, um, it, it provided for purity uh, before marriage and it provided for a wise understanding of what you were getting. And this is the embedding, I believe, of the wedding parables where they uh, uh, have in Luke 12, it says, Be watching when I come and knock that you open immediately. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord finds watching. He will gird himself and make them sit down and eat and will serve him. Well, that's the imagery of the Lord's Supper last night at Passover. And by the way, these wedding parables all have Passover imagery, okay? Amos 3, 7 said God isn't going to do anything without revealing it, okay? So uh, Passover, hello. Ellen White says in uh, Great Controversy, page 399, the last line on the page, point four, fourth paragraph, says uh, how Christ died as a Passover lamb. In like manner, the types that relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. When the symbolic service, it was Passover, when God executed judgment on Egypt and took his people to the covenant. And God executed judgment on Christ at Passover. Titus came to uh, Jerusalem at Passover time in, in 70 AD. Even Sodom had judgment. Uh, the clue is um, Genesis 19, verse 3, Lot fed his guests unleavened bread. Unleavened, that's the clue for Passover. That's the feast that... Seven days at, at Passover time is unleavened bread. And why unleavened bread? Okay, well, Christ gave the clue in Matthew 16, verse um, 12, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. They have, you know, and, and Ellen White says we're repeating their history. We've leavened the bread. Passover's not important in the church. No, no need to it. Ellen White tried to say it. Uh, she had to say it very carefully or the church would edit it and uh, leaders uh, cut things out. But uh, in Desire of Ages, page 652, she says, and this is second paragraph, in remembrance of me, as he, Christ, ate the Passover with his disciples, he instituted in his place the service that was to be the memorial of his great sacrifice. So in its place, we should uh, do the Lord's Supper at Passover. We don't have to kill lambs. We don't have to uh, eat bitter herbs. 
but we should then go out and watch and pray. If we reviewed the scenes of Christ's life at that time, we would be eating lamb, spiritually. We would see how that lamb was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of his peace is upon us, and with his stripes we are healed. And so that's the time, the annual Sabbath, it's not fair to cut the, sab the word Sabbath, Shabbat, into two and just keep the seventh day and can the others which are not interested. We should uh, take them as a yearly memorial, memorial of the greatest events in Old Testament and New Testament. And um, if the types that relate to the second advent will be fulfilled then, we're going to miss it if we're not having communion and watching on the eve of Passover. There's an important um, uh, modification of this that I'm going to uh, not share with you right now, but urge you to get this book, uh, Destruction of Jerusalem. It's um, the heads-up sign that I believe we'll see this spring. Last spring, th tens of thousands of Muslims were on the Gaza-Israeli border to protest Israel. And they didn't c cross the border. I thought they might because Zechariah 14 says the day of the Lord comes, which is the end time. This is not about 70 A.D. It's the day of the Lord, end time. And I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The houses will be rifled, the women ravished, half the city will go into captivity. Then the Lord will go forth to fight against them. So we're going to see a house cleaning. I shared my uh, thoughts with a uh, Messianic rabbi who said, uh, I was telling him that I thought we would see a major earthquake in this country. He said, why this country? I said, well, uh, judgment begins at the house of God. He said, don't forget God has two houses. He's going to clean them both before he puts them together. And I think uh, Laodicea needs cleaning as well. And we will see an earthquake. Ellen White saw an earthquake while she visited Loma Linda. Uh, huge event. You can read about it in volume 9, page 92, 93. Um, on page 94, she's talking about, uh, mentions how a couple days later, an earthquake at San Francisco happened. And most people think she's just talking about San Francisco. But she's not talking about San Francisco. I was taught that she was on the scene of uh, when she had visions concerning that place. She was at Loma Linda. And in page 95, she says, Through his prophet Zephaniah, the Lord specifies judgments he will bring on evildoers. And she uh, quotes Zephaniah 1.8, In the day of the Lord's sacrifice, God will punish the king's children. So that's, that's not about San Francisco. That's about Adventists. Okay? And we have leavened the bread, and we have had closed doors to the truth. And it's about time we wake up. If we don't uh, preach the truth, and, and I'm appealing, I want to appeal to ministers as well. This is not about your salary. You know, we preach to people, oh, give up the, give up your uh, job for the Sabbath. Okay. Well, uh, it's it's time to give up your job if you're afraid you're going to be fired because we need to preach the truth, or or we will be spewed out. That's uh, the language of Laodicea. So. Uh, Thank you for considering this. Please um, like it if, uh, on the YouTube message and look, click the link if you want. Um, this coming uh, Sabbath on Saturday, you can get this book free uh, in the ebook form on um, Amazon. And uh, I, if you click the link at the bottom of this, right below this video, I will have a description and a link at the end. So that's where you go to click it. And um, please share with your friends. Wise virgins have light to share, okay? And that's uh, both in Matthew 25 and also in Luke 12, verse 35. We have lights burning. And so, uh, and by the way, there's deeper meanings to all of these little phrases uh, that are all still compatible. Ellen White says that uh, to say that the Bible means this and nothing more is to say what is not actuated by the Spirit of God. I'll take you to a deeper meaning on the light burning. If you go to where you first find a burning lamp, it is in Genesis 15, when God, as a burning lamp, made a covenant with Abraham. And so he wants, though in the end time, he wants us to have our lamps burning. God was the proactive agent in that covenant with Abraham. We must be proactive at this time and seek the covenant and be ready for it. And I'm seeing uh, uh, that the unleavened bread represents truths for Elijah, God, Christ said in Matthew, by the way, we talked about uh, Matthew 16, verse 12, how he said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. In the next chapter, verse 17, verse 11, he says, before he comes, Elias or Elijah must first come and restore all things. And we see that coming in Matthew, I'm sorry, Malachi 4, 4 and 5. Remember the law of Moses with the statutes. Well, 
those statutes uh, which Ellen White supports, and in fact her comments on Malachi 4.4, 4, say that Christ gave to Moses religious precepts which were to govern everyday life. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. They were to be binding upon men in every age as long as time should last. And those statutes, by the way, uh, supported and endorsed and, and joined the annual Sabbaths in Leviticus 23. You'll see that they are statutes. So, you know, we, we have been poor at understanding those. We, we have favored the little horn that uh, boasts that they abolished those Jewish festivals. Well, they're not Jewish. God said they're my festival, my feast. Okay, and they're at Moed. The last verse of Leviticus 23 says Moed or appointed times. That word comes from Genesis 1.14 when God uh, appointed the sun and moon for Moed, appointed times. Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and those appointed times were appointed before the foundation of the world, and we can honor them as a memorial, not Sunday because it's uh, a pagan holiday of the resurrection, but because God appointed uh, the Passover as a time for celebration. So, annual Sabbath. And so, uh, when we think of Elijah is supposed to restore all things, we can be that Elijah as the 144,000. I think that's really the meaning of Elijah. You know, John the Baptist wasn't really Elijah reincarnated as the, as the same person. He, was, he, he just had that function. But in the end time, Christ is going to have 144,000 who are his bride. They get it. It's not about unleavened bread. The, un, the unleavened bread was for seven days at Passover time, and weddings in the Bible were for seven days. Um, Laban told Jacob to fulfill Leah's week in Genesis 29 verse 27. Leah's week, the wedding, okay? And our wedding will be a week. It's the seven days of unleavened bread. And there are seven topics that have a sevenfold emphasis. I mentioned the statutes, but in Ezekiel 20 verse 11 to 24, they have a sevenfold emphasis where they're linked to the word Sabbaths with an S, okay? Not just seventh day Sabbath, but Sabbaths. And it's statutes, judgment, Sabbath, statutes, judgment, Sabbath, statutes, judgment, Sabbath. Those are a sign of God's people. And uh, they give you an index of, of a couple of the topics that we must have for our wedding. Okay, The, the statutes and the Sabbaths are part of, uh, they're contextually linked to the seals in, in Revelation 6. The uh, first seal, I'll give you an example of this and then we'll quit. I uh, want you to be uh, looking and searching. The... Um, when John heard thunder, it was uh, one of the four beasts that says, "Come and see." And the uh, then and, and it says, "Behold, a white horse." A white horse is a message of truth for the end time, just like the early gospel went as a white horse. And Ellen White's last book, last chapter, page seven twenty-five in Prophets and Kings, she said, "The church, clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, will go forth into all the world." conquering and to conquer. That's the phrase of the white horse. We can be there. We can do that. It's about making a covenant previous to that. In page 7, 13, and 14, it says covenant-keeping people. And to them will be fulfilled all the covenant promises. Think of covenant. Think of marriage. Okay, They, they go together. And we, we marry Christ if we're ready when he knocks. The knock is an earthquake, like we said before. Um, it's, in Hebrew, it has a severe meaning. This was pointed out to me by Richard Davidson of Andrews University when he said you might be right about the earthquake because in Judges 19, the, the men were beating the door, knocking, beating the door down. And uh, bottom line is it's not always gentle Jesus just knocking at the door of my heart and there will always be an opportunity. There won't always be an opportunity. And we need to be ready for the knock that I believe could be this spring. And if you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, Christ said, you know its desolation is nigh. And uh, we are online for the next. That's the sign. But important modification that I have not shared with you, I want you to get the book and to be, understand it better. Uh, it's not about money, though. You can get it free this coming Saturday, or you can buy it uh, two ninety nine for any other time. I'm not really caring about money. I just want people to start liking the message and understanding it, that there's much more than just Jesus is going to save me somehow, even though I don't know how. Thank you very much. God bless you.